One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. I declare a thumb war. Hello, willkommen, bienvenue, konnichiwa, ni hao, jambo, marhaba, and all the universal greetings that we try and remember. Mm-hmm. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again, episode 228 on Sunday, the 24th of April, 2022. We're back from our Easter recess and happy to be here, although I am rather stressed. <laughs> I must admit I've been rather stressed out tonight because everything seems to be going fucking wrong. <laughs> anyway... Um, happy uh, for you to be joining us. I'm Amish Phil. I'm Amish Matt. <laughs> Amish Ben's. Uh, he, he knew. He foretold <laughs> that something horrible and horrendous was going to happen tonight. So he's bailed. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but never mind because we've got Robert Frederick with us here from the Hidden Life Is Best podcast. How are you doing, Robert? Greetings. Uh, very good. Very good. Glad to be with you. Yeah. I mean, we were talking on the on the email earlier and. Um, this sort of period of history that your podcast focuses on, this sort of um, sort of area, Francis Bacon around um, mm-hmm. the restoration of the monarchy, and well, a bit earlier, and and uh, mm-hmm. what, there's all this stuff going on, like the gunpowder plot and the Black Death and it's the Invisible College. I I was I'm like a complete novice, but I'm I was like I was saying to you, I'm completely got the bug now for this this period of yeah. history. It's amazing. But it's incredibly yeah. complicated, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. You've got like these I mean, religious, I mean, like there's like the sectarian stuff, and then there's the things with foreign uh, influences and foreign powers and spy networks, and uh, I just uh, I really struggle to get my head around incredible. it. Yeah, it's really hard. It's uh, it's just a vast amount of information. I I prefer to call it the Tudor era, and um, smack. It's really what I'm talking about is the end of the Tudor era. So Bacon was born in 1561, and uh, historians call it early modern, early modern London. And that's a map of early modern London on the screen. It's a really cool website. It's called Agas London. It's interactive, so you can click on London Wall, and you get that wall. And over to the left is Whitehall where the queen lived and in the middle is where bacon was born at a place called york house and i think this map was drawn a little earlier than that or or around that time but he was born pretty much in the palace and the rumor started right away um that he was the son of the virgin queen elizabeth And they were put to rest right away, uh, quite brutally. Apparently, some people lost their tongues or their ears, or Ooh. you couldn't you couldn't chat about it. But there's a, any number of clues and uh, circumstantial evidence that actually he was he was a tutor himself. And the Tudors are fascinating, and this whole period is fascinating because it was still had a foot in the medieval world. They were still jousting mm-hmm. right there at Whitehall Palace. They had a jousting court. <laughs> and they were still brutally executing people in public in the city of London, like horrible public executions. Mm. But it was the early modern era. The Renaissance was in full swing in Italy. It had come to London, and there was music and poetry, and the theater had started. And Francis Bacon himself is credited with being the beginning of what's called the Enlightenment era, which followed the Renaissance, Age of Reason. 
So in a way, Bacon had his foot in all three worlds. And yeah, what was going on there in Tudor London is really, really incredible. And I, I'm not a historian or anything, but I do think that Tudor London was kind of the equivalent of Athens, Greece, and you know Florence, Italy. Oh, because it's so because it's been so uh, influential in the preceding yeah. years. It's like a, a sea change moment. Sea change. That is a word invented by Shakespeare, I found out, because I've been oh. digging into the tempest. Oh, right. And uh, sea change, yeah. Those were pearls that were his eyes. Full Fathom Five, Thy Father Lies. Those were pearls. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Something, something, something. He suffered a sea change. But mm. this era right there, that Tudor era, the world started changing the world. You know, and the British Empire really began in that era. And as you mentioned, the Rosicrucian manifestos came out just after the Tudor era. They came out 1614. The Tudor era ended in 1603 when Elizabeth died. But the, the ball got rolling there. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the conquest of the States had begun with Sir Walter Raleigh. And he's one of the geniuses, you know, of Tudor London with Sir Walter Raleigh, which is a crazy story in and of itself. But the British Empire began right there, amongst many other things, got started in Tudor London. And it's just incredible what, what happened, what, what, what came out of London in the next two or 300 years. It's mind boggling. And the interactions there, which of course involved the uh, Protestant church and breaking away from Catholic church uh, the beginning of, of modern espionage with Walsingham, but Bacon was involved in, in that very heavily. And uh, yes, <laughs> so I didn't know anything about it. I never paid any attention to the, uh, you know, the royalty of England. I always like poo pooed it, like who cares? But man, he starts scratching and it's, it's really intense. Yeah. So, so is Bacon, I'm trying to think of who he was sort of contemporaneous with. What what about the other characters like John Dee and, and Francis Walsingham and who who were, yeah. would he have been like all those his, guys. Yeah. All of them. They're so they're all knocking about, they're all sort of in the same Yep. yep. Uh Christopher Marlowe. Oh yeah. The play, uh, uh William Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Uh Thomas Nash, Thomas Kidd, Sir Walter Raleigh, John Dee. Francis Drake. Uh, this, mm-hmm. Drake. There's a guy named Thomas Harriet who's unknown today, but he was an incredible mathematician and linguist and was in at uh, Roanoke Colony, Raleigh's Colony. Uh, Queen Elizabeth is quite brilliant. Mary Sidney, Philip Sidney. Uh, Essex, the Earl of Essex. Uh, Robert Dudley. Bacon's purported father and the Cecils, William oh. Cecil and Robert Cecil. Right. So the book, I'm, incredible cast of characters. Yeah. I was just going to say the book I'm reading at the moment, which is a bit like a biography of Francis Walsingham. William Cecil yeah. features very prominently in that. He was known as Lord Burley as well. I think the yeah. queen gave her the title yeah. Lord Burley. And they seem to be like, a, um, like a tag team. Like they, they, them two yeah. seem to have been, pretty much running the country on behalf of the queen. Do you get that sort of impression? It gives you that impression that the people who you think are in power maybe aren't actually pulling the strings. Sounds familiar. Yeah, I think (laughs) Cecil, William Cecil was the most powerful man in England. And they somehow hooked up with the queen when she first took the throne. They had known each other. And uh, she tapped him to be uh, not secretary of state. What's the, you know, the head of the government there. And her story is mind boggling. That whole progression that went from, you know, Henry the eighth to Edward, Lady Jane Grey, Bloody Mary, and then Elizabeth. I mean, it shouldn't have happened. She was kind of a long way from the throne. Do you think um, maybe people who were friendly with Elizabeth, maybe some of these figures like Cecil, maybe so, had a hand in orchestrating her rise to the throne? 
Apparently, apparently not. Apparently not. Bloody Mary just got sick. I mean, unless they poisoned her. That's what, yeah. We just don't. And know. I'm not sure about Lady Jane Grey. She didn't even want to be queen. She got manipulated into becoming queen, and lasted nine days. And she did have a a power base, so they had to cut off her head. I'm not real clear on all of that. But she didn't even want to be queen. But you know, there was much jostling. Yeah, and, um, and the Mary Queen of Scots is, is involved as well. And, and then she had a power base, and she had a claim to the throne. But it was also Elizabeth was was quite brilliant, and she she had seen the inner workings of government since a little girl. She lost her mother; her mother lost her head. And she watched Henry the Eighth govern, and she knew how the world worked. She was brilliant. Apparently, she read and wrote in Latin flawlessly. They were all really well educated. They had read all the Latin, all the Greek. Mm -hmm. They knew math. They uh, history, theology. The education of the aristocrats in uh, in early modern London was really, really strong. I mean, one of the they were things all really smart. Sorry to interrupt. One of the things that you mentioned no. on your podcast, "The Hidden Life Is Best," is that. It seems like, in your opinion, Francis Bacon was probably the most brilliant man who ever lived. I think so. I mean, just uh, explain the that to guy us. that ever lived. Yep, I think he's the most influential person that ever lived. And I didn't know much about him. It's going on like two or three years. I, he was on my radar. I was curious, and I had this stupendous synchronicity. I was watching a video about the about Jamestown and some of the maps that came out of Jamestown and Jamestown is the first successful English colony in America it started in 1606 and I'm just watching this video and it was on a river called the Susquehanna it comes up through New York and I lived on the Susquehanna River when I was in college so it was kind of curious to me yeah, it's fascinating details and then the guy said francis bacon was a key player in the founding of jamestown and i was just kind of thunderstruck it's just another thing that bacon was involved in and i uh i won't go into the whole details of the synchronicity but i had randomly thrown a book on my bed thinking i'd never looked at this book i bought it on the street 10 years ago and it had nothing to do with the Susquehanna or even history or anything. And I opened the book after I had written this email to my friend who had gone to college with me on the Susquehanna. And I said, oh, man, you got to see this video. And Francis Bacon was involved in Francis Bacon, Francis Bacon, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I finished the email, shut off the computer, pick up the book, open it randomly. And near the bottom of one of the pages at the end of the book, for some reason, I looked there and my eyes fell on the words Francis Bacon. And the book is called The Roots of Coincidence. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just thunderstruck. And so I wrote the synchronicity off to Grimerica because they were collecting synchronicities. Oh, what, what score did you get? You know, this is before they were given scores. Oh, man. Uh, wow. Preschool. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, not there. And, uh, I got seven for mine. Yeah. You know, just saying. You got a seven? <laughs> yeah. Not to brag or anything, but that's pretty high from Darren. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I just have to, I have to follow this up. I have to look into Francis Bacon. And that's how I got into it. And then there's a whole world of Francis Bacon. Like people start going down this rabbit hole and they, you know, they go crazy. The first person that did it was Delia Bacon, who was an American woman. She was an actress and she was doing Shakespeare. And she thought, there's no way these plays were popular and there's no way this uneducated country boy wrote these plays. And so she started digging in and she really started the modern Baconian was Shakespeare theory. Right, that's a good. Uh, she literally went mad. <laughs> she 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 died in London, I think, in a 
What in a madhouse? What, what's the the sort of evidence, Robert, for William Shakespeare being the author? Like none. <laughs> <laughs> there so must be something. It's, inc- it's oh. incredible. It's incredible. So that got me into this. Uh, was I heard a podcast, and the guy said the only written evidence we have of William Shakespeare from Stratford are six signatures, three of which were on his will. There's absolutely nothing else in his handwriting. There's no <laughs> manuscripts of the plays, no manuscripts of the poems. There's not one letter written from him to anyone. There's not one letter written to him from anyone, not one. And this is an age of you know constant letter writing. Well, I mean, why would you write a letter to someone to, to someone who's illiterate? <laughs> <laughs> so gives it away, Apparently, really. Well, apparently he couldn't read or write. His daughter on her marriage certificate had to sign an X. Um, there appears to have been no books in his home. There's no mention of books in his will. There's no evidence he ever went to school. It just goes on and on and on like that. And recently a woman, an American scholar named Diana Price, wrote a book called The Shakespeare Authorship Question. And there's a half hour video on YouTube where she decided, let me, let me just go in and really examine it. Because people say, well, how much evidence do you have about Christopher Marlowe or Thomas Kidd or Thomas Nash and what's really available for anyone? So she dug in and, you know, did a whole spreadsheet on it. And she said, well, there's evidence for everyone else and there's none for William Shakespeare. Like literally almost none. And what evidence there is, is all secondhand. There's like almost nobody talked about him as a playwright at that time or knew him as a playwright or mentioned him as a playwright. There's almost no no firsthand evidence. All there really is is that what's called the first folio, Mm. that giant book of all 36 plays that came out um, seven years after Shakespeare died and three years before Francis Bacon died. Wow. I mean, it's quite staggering to think that the world's greatest playwright wouldn't teach his own daughter how to read and write. Yeah. It doesn't make the evidence sense. Evidence becomes overwhelming if you're if you're open minded to it. And people that have you know, academics that have bought the story just can't accept it. It's just too mind blowing for them to think like, I Oh, just, we've been fooled. It's been four hundred years I was of just being fooled and lied to. But if you come to it fresh, you're like, Yeah, how could this guy have written the plays? Especially if you know the plays, they're really dense. Yeah, I was just Is wondering really? what, what's the kind of um, I was going to say the play, but what's the uh, the gain by sort of having somebody else being the real author of these plays and letting oh. him have the uh, um, well, credit. there you go. What is the? There you go. That's. I just want to say one more thing. Mark Twain uh, wrote a book then in 1908 called "Is Shakespeare Dead?" and it's very funny, and he was kind of angry about it. Because uh, he's a commoner genius. Because one of the one of the pushbacks is like, "Oh, you don't think a common lad could could be a genius? You only believe in like educated genius." Well, Mark Twain was a genius, and he was a commoner. I think he barely went to school, mm. and he was a writer. And so he analyzed the whole thing from the point of view of a writer. Mm-hmm. And if this commoner from Stratford wrote these plays he found that very odd because there's not a single mention of Stratford. There's not a single mention of barely any common people, you know, and you write what you know. Right. And a lot of the Shakespeare plays are like, you need to be classically educated. You know, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra. Mm. Yeah. 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 And a lot of the plays came from Italian plays that hadn't even been translated. So you would have had to spoken Italian. Some of them were Latin. Right, of course. He would have had to know Latin really well. Mm-hmm. So, oh, Ben Johnson's another genius who was running around Tudor London. So that's the question. And then Baconites say, well, you couldn't be a 
aristocrat and write plays. It was considered beneath an aristocrat. An aristocrat oh, couldn't I work see. for money. These are very high-ranking people in the, in the peerage, in the gentry. So they say that. They had to keep it hidden, and that's their only excuse. But I'm thinking, because I came to the whole thing pretty late, and what I've decided is that Bacon had to do it in a hidden way, and they all did if they were aristocrats, but he was doing it in order to unify the English people behind the Tudors, because one of the things that's a standard of Shakespeare scholarship is that the history plays, there's 10 history plays, Richard II, Richard III, Henry IV, Henry VI, they're all obviously pro-Tudor. They all obviously give the message that, you know, the Tudor line is the line, and, you know, that's what we, they, they, they bolster the Tudor claim to the throne. They're propaganda. History plays are basically propaganda. Especially a Richard III, where they make him out to be this psychotic <laughs> you know, dictator criminal because that's the guy that Henry the seventh took power from. So he's especially, that's especially propagandistic, but they all are. And they're brilliant. They're brilliant as propaganda and they, they worked. They, they really helped make the English people very patriotic. And it and makes, was sorry, goal. sorry. It makes sense in the historical context in that, you know, Elizabeth was very vulnerable at different points. And like you, you mentioned, the, the sort of internecile, internecile, is that the word? Sort of, um, you know, the threat from Mary Queen of Scots or the threat from yeah. the uh, papists, as they called them, yep. you know, from Rome oh, or yeah. from Spain, Spanish yep. armadas at this time as well. Yeah. So, oh yeah, big time. She was very vulnerable. They yeah. were. That's why they became the greatest spies of all time. That's where it started, right there. This modern espionage started. Yeah, the Walsingham uh, was a genius. Cecil too. The James Bond music plays a, a key part in your podcast. <laughs> yeah, because well, whilst, John D yeah. was 007. You know that, right? Yeah, the first. That's, that's become st common knowledge. John D was an occultist. He was brilliant. He's another incredible genius who traveled England spying using kind of secret occult information he he was privy to. He was sort of selling that as his calling card, like, get to know me and you'll get occult powers, kind of loosely, and spying all the time and sending letters back to Elizabeth signed 007. So... You know, it carries right into the modern era. That that time period carries right into the modern era. And that's kind of the point of the podcast is is what incredible influence that time period had on the modern world. Absolutely. It just goes on and on and on and on from the Rosicrucians to the Freemasons to science. You know, you're reading that book on the Royal Society. And so much of it came right from Francis Bacon. And what? almost nobody knows his name. Mm. Almost nobody knows who he was. No. There's very few statues of him, especially in America. Um, yeah, I was just saying before the podcast uh, that I thought we were going to be talking about a painter. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, from people like think the, of the mid, painter. Yeah, 20th century. But no, there is another Francis Bacon. Yeah, who's probably the most influential person who ever lived, and almost nobody knows anything about him. No, I mean, an anyone... Um, sort of reading the, the sort of standard history in this period, we'll be able to understand how influential all these characters are, and particularly Francis Bacon. But what interests me is the sort of the more occult side of things that you think were going on. What What's, what's your take on Francis Bacon and what sort of uh, occult influences he had was he members of secret societies do you think or what what do you think is going on on that oh yeah yeah i think i think that there was a heavy occult undertone to the tutors and i think it was from the templars 
And there was a huge Templar influence in London and it came to a screeching halt in 1307 when the French king arrested all the Templars in France and um, started questioning them. And then on uh, 1314, they burned the grandmaster of the Templar, Jacques de Malloy, in front of Notre Dame. And by then, England had outlawed the Templars, too. And they were essentially outlawed throughout Europe. Mm. And they had this enormous wealth and enormous power, but they weren't as powerful as kings. They weren't as powerful as the Pope. So the Pope issued a decree, and they got moved on and driven underground. And that's where the secrecy began and the need for secrecy because they could literally be burned at the stake. And apparently dozens of them were, especially in France. Yeah. And they went underground and eventually became the Freemasons. And that is pretty much settled history. It's been rumored for years and years and years. But the book I told, uh, I told you about Born in Blood by John Robinson, who's not a conspiracy guy at all. He's a historian who stumbled on this story via the Peasants' Rebellion that happened in, I think, 1370. Right. He started investigating the very famous Peasants' Rebellion and stumbled on the fact that everybody said there seemed to be a guiding hand to the Peasants' Rebellion and using various clues, he traced it to the Templars and the Templars... <laughs> You know, or just another, like, huge, incredible, fascinating story. And they got mixed up with the occult. They got mixed up with Gnosticism in the Middle East when they were um, guarding the temple, Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, which the, uh, the Crusaders conquered Jerusalem in, like, 1117 or something. I'm not sure of all the dates exactly. And the Templars were formed shortly thereafter, and their headquarters were right there on Solomon's Temple, uh, on the Second Temple, well, not Solomon's Temple, but the uh, Temple of Jerusalem. It was the stables, wasn't it, I think? Solomon's Stables, was it, where they had most of the guys? Uh, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, wasn't it? Yeah, right. they were that right the there. They were right there on the ruins of the temple. Of course, it's yeah. in ruins. It's where the Wailing Wall is now. Mm. Rumors were they found some secret information there they found the holy grail there's all these crazy stories surrounding what the templars did there and um but they did have enormous power they were the world's first bankers they had sailing ships they had tons of gold and uh when they got shut down because apparently they were heavily involved in the occult and worshiping uh you know, demons, Baphomet, they worship Baphomet, and some head named Baphomet, and practicing heresy. Mm. But it appears like what it was is that they were involved in a form of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is another huge, crazy story, but it's a type of religion that sprang up around the time of, of Christ. And it's roughly Christian, but in a very different way than Catholicism or Christianity that we know. And they saw Christ as kind of a liberator and that this world was made by an evil demiurge yeah. that trapped our souls in matter. And they saw Jesus as someone who was teaching you how to liberate yourself from this realm of matter and, and your soul could escape. They believe in reincarnation. There's a lot of Buddhism in it. They kind of are a mix of all the old religions. Mm. And that's what the Gnostics believed. So they could go two ways. They could go into a very purified, uh, ascetic state where they reject the world and, and pray and wear rough clothes and don't eat meat and don't have sex. And they're the perfectus. They're the perfect eye. Or they could go into the libertine route where there are no rules. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted and kind of become these Alistair Crowley type 
religion. And this is all pretty, this is all standard history. Now, whether the Templars were Gnostics or not, that's up for debate, but mm. kind of, you know, it's kind of a mainstream belief that they got infected with this, this Gnosticism. I think the problem the time was, sorry, Russ, sorry to interrupt, Robert. I think I, one of the no. problems that uh, we come across with that theory on the Templars is that a lot of yeah. the mainstream historians will say the, um, you know, Philip of France owed, owed them a fortune and, and it was his sort of personal yeah. vendetta. He, he wanted to get out of paying his debts yeah. and, and they were like you, yeah. you described, they were incredibly powerful. They had huge, yeah. they had military capabilities, their own ships flying the Jolly Roger. Oh, no. used to fly yep. the, yep, fly that's the where the Jolly Roger. Roger comes from. Yeah. So, there's, this is this is why it's so difficult. There's always a, like a, a more plain theory that competes against, you know, what I want to be true. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to make sense of it all, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. But a lot of that history has kind of been whitewashed just because it, it is so weird. Yeah. It is so strange, but if you dig into the Freemasons, you know, they're not very Christian and they have these links to these very Gnostic elements. Right. Like, uh, the morning star, that sort of deal. Yeah. 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 The Masons are not Christian. They, they, all you have to do is say you believe in God and you can be Christian, but they don't have a lot of ceremony or ritual centered around Jesus Christ. They do have a Knights Templar degree and that's the most Christian, ironically, that's the most Christian degree in Freemasonry. <laughs> so there's the connection between the Templars and the very occult based esoteric Freemasons. So that kind of lends credence to this idea that the Templars were mixed up in a different religion, which was very common at the time. There were the uh, Cathars in Southern France, and the Bogomils in um, the Balkans, and they were acknowledged Gnostics, and they were thought of as heretics. Mm -hmm. They themselves thought of themselves as Christians, and they thought of the Catholic Church as just, you know, your average Christians, and they had the secret knowledge, or Gnosis, which is, Gnosis means knowledge. So they thought they had a secret knowledge that made them different or better, maybe, or they just believed in different things, but they still thought of themselves as Christians. So the church thought of them as heretics, and, it, and a horrible uh, crusade occurred in southern France called the Albigensian Crusade, yeah. where the church slaughtered, you know, I don't know, 100,000 Gnostics. I've just uh, picked up a book that I, I, uh, I picked up at a charity shop for 80 pence. Nice. That's about 50 uh -huh. cents. And it's called uh -huh. uh, the, the Yellow Cross, the story of the last Cathars, 1290 to 1329. So yeah, that's on this go. sort of subject. It's not, you know, a mystery that things were very brutal back then, especially if you were labeled a heretic. And I mm. suppose that is the ideal motivation for, for folks like Frank Bacon. If they were Gnostics exactly. or, or heretics, heretics to keep it on the DL. Yeah, rather than being Oh, buried in very the much. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the secrecy was of extreme importance if you had... Any sort of ideas that weren't mainstream <laughs> Christian ideas. And not Which just, could, uh, so It had loosened up because guys like John Dee are running around writing, you know, books, Monus Hieroglyphica. And, uh, right. So, because he was the, the astrologer as well. So there is this yeah. sort of, there is a bit of play in between, yeah. isn't there? As long as you didn't challenge the primacy of Christ and the church and the Trinity, right. you started to be able to get away with a lot of stuff. And there's a great book by the mainstream scholar. Her name is Frances Yates. She wrote a book called The Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Mm. And she tells the whole story of the hermetic literature that got discovered. And the hermetic literature they thought was written by Hermes Trismegistus. And it, it was a forged, it's actually from the second century Gnostic era. 
but it painted a different picture of humanity as not people burdened down and afraid of sinning and just trying to get through life. It gave this impression that, you know, there was limitless potential for human beings and that it really kind of started the Renaissance, this discovery of the Hermetic literature, along with the Greeks and along with the Kabbalah that came out of Spain and Southern France and Kabbalah is very Gnostic and that, and it all came into Italy and Lorenzo de Medici had it translated and everyone started being able to discuss this stuff right in Rome and right in Florence. Right. He, w- he went on a mad time. mission to uh, translate all the ancient Greeks, didn't he, Medici? Yeah. They were like... And Pico della Mirandola wrote about it, Oration on the Dignity of Man, and it really kick-started the Renaissance and kind of got Europe out of the Dark Ages. <laughs> Really interesting and magic. And so Gnostics are really into magic and magic ritual. And somehow magic began to be debated. As long as it had a Christian veneer, you know, it kind of began to be talked about and accepted as almost like a science. And there's this guy, Cornelius Agrippa mm-hmm. von Nettesheim, who's a famous magician that knew Erasmus. And D is just after this period. So it led right up to D and all this kind of magic and astrology and numerology and Kabbalah, all that stuff just started bubbling and fermenting all over Italy, Germany, England, France, pretty loose, you know, it was, uh, was somehow tolerated by the church. If you didn't cross certain lines or kind of paid your respects to Christianity which is exactly what Rosicrucianism did. Uh, It has a very Christian veneer. They mentioned the Trinity and Jesus, um, as did Bacon's book, The New Atlantis. And uh, so that was all going on. Hmm. It It was all happening. Magic was really big. And then, of course, there was alchemy, too. People were doing these, you know, crazy experiments and they claimed they had found the philosopher's stone, which is a substance that could turn anything into gold. And that's what uh, John Dee claimed he had. The guy, he was his sidekick, Edward Kelly, claimed he had the philosopher's stone. But there was, there was this idea that you could gain, gain great power through alchemy and magic and transform physical reality with this kind of new science, it was considered almost like a science or it was a science. And Bacon is given credit. The famous book about him is Francis Bacon from magic to science. So all that was going on at the same time as the counter reformation and the reformation. And uh, it was really incredible, really fertile period. Mm -hmm. What crazy. So, yeah, Bacon was heavily into it, too. What? The cult was big. Oh, yeah, still is. <laughs> when still it co- is. Big, it's back, it's back. Yeah. When when it comes to, like, magic and, and these ceremonies, what do you think's going on? Do you think it is something magical in the old sense, or do you think it's something just rooted in our psychology, or, or, what, or do you think there's nothing there? It's, it's kind of pointless. What's your take on magic? Uh, well, I put a lot of thought into this. I mean, I personally think everything is magic. I think our bodies are magic. I think nature is magic. I think there are such things as telepathy and precognitive dreams and intuition. But their kind of magic is really associated with controlling demons, like reaching out and actually changing the course of life with your ceremonies and your ritual, which I can't say I believe in that, but I do believe in like the power of positive thinking. I do believe that if you put your mind on something, you can make things happen. I mean, it's obviously true. You know, you put your mind on doing a podcast. Look at you guys, you got 280 podcasts. And I do believe in prayer. I think prayer work. So do, can they, in a way your question comes down to, can they actually 
enlist the aid of demons or enlist the aid of disincarnate, you know, entities. And I, I can't say I believe that, but they believe it. But I think what they're doing is, is a form of hypnosis. It's a form of mind control. Like they do these rituals and it, it helps focus your mind. And if you focus your mind and you've got 50 mates in your lodge with your mind focused too, and you're going to be able to make things happen as a group, like a good, you know, soccer team or basketball team. Right. So self hypnosis. Really, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a form of hypnosis, self hypnosis. I think what's real is hypnosis. I think hypnosis is a, is a huge key to all of this stuff. I think theater can be hypnotic and music and language and making people believe things, you know, as a form of hypnosis and mind control. And I think occult is largely mind control and very synonymous with cult, cult and occult. I don't think it's an accident that they're together. And as we know, cults are all about mind control. So I think, I think that's a lot of what's going on. That's, that's what I've come to. Well, we've seen, certainly seen a lot of mind control over the last two years, I think. Thank you for that. Absolutely. It's really freakish. Just <laughs> this mask thing. Mm. And these are educated people that know science. I mean, a mask is not going to stop a virus. Just not. Maybe a certain kind of mask worn a certain kind of way. But it's not even that dangerous a virus. If you just do the numbers and do the math, you know, it's almost only really old people that die and out of shape old people. Yeah. But people put a mask on their kids. Right. It's, it's become like a, rich, it's, like a ritual, hasn't it? <laughs> they, they made a ritual out of something, you know, with the TV and I don't know, it just scared everyone. I mean, fear is a big part of it, right? And fear reward. And uh, but to me, got, go ahead. To me, a big change happened over here. The, the big change happened when they changed the law. So I was, I was going to the supermarket every week throughout the pandemic. We didn't get deliveries, mm -hmm. uh, not first anyway. And uh, very few people were wearing masks. I want to say maybe 10%. And generally the older, older people were wearing masks. The day that they changed the law to say it was a legal requirement, everyone wore masks. Wow. Yeah. Apart, apart from a few. It's, um, it just shows well, how... They're masters. Yeah. They're masters of control. They, they appeal to your better nature, right? You want to be a good person. We all think we're good people. Well, you want to be a good person, you'll wear a mask to protect others. Yeah. It's not just about you. And so that especially appeals to women, I think. And, you know, and then you're, you don't want to be thought of as a bad person. And then it's not such a big deal to put a mask on. And before you know it, yeah, like 98% of the people have a mask on. Outdoors, you can't catch a virus outdoors. Everyone knows that too, unless someone comes up and, you know, spits in your eye, spits in your nose. You don't catch a virus outdoors, but that's where you put the mask on. And yeah. you do catch it indoors, so having everyone stay inside just would spread spread the virus. Was it even tell you to open the windows? Was you it know, Spain? Crazy. Was it Spain where they were telling people to wear the masks on the beach? There was people wearing masks on the beach in Spain, yes, in the height of the this wasn't it yeah yeah it's so crazy people did it you know this is what's so attractive to just getting lost in history is you don't <laughs> yeah. have to think about the f stuff that's going on today <laughs> maybe this is part of my my issue I was, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah i was just wondering as well um i think i noticed just before the podcast did you have a um a picture of Francis Bacon, some kind of seal with him to do with the yeah, Royal Society. Yeah, let, let me see what I see what I have here. So here's the Bible. Francis Bacon is rumored to have been the final editor of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got pictures of Bacon here. There's a book about his connection to Freemasonry. Uh, 
is an emblem of John D passing the lamp to Francis Bacon, and you'll see the rose on his foot indicating mm. uh, what is a crucian. Um, wow. Right, okay, so the rose on the foot is pointing towards a Rosicrucian yep. link there. Isn't that funny? I don't seem to have any pictures of bacon. I must. No, it must have been on the the email, I think. You might have sent it on the email, and I've just confused it with one of these ones, that's all. I've got one, uh, Robert. I've got there the... We go. Oh, God. Yeah, that there we go. Oh, there he is. He always had a hat on. I don't think he was bald, though. <laughs> I bet he was. Here's him as an 18-year-old. Yeah, I think he probably was. Yeah, there he is as an 18-year-old, the famous Hilliard portrait. Oh, right, okay. Where what's written here, the, Hilliard was a court painter. Mm-hmm. It says, if I could only paint his mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he was 18. And, he's, and they've already got yeah. something like that written around him. Yeah, he was... Really, what I think, what I've been able to put together is that he was astonishingly precocious. Mm. And could speak and read Latin and Greek by like the age of seven. <laughs> he was kind of like a Mozart of right. language and words. Okay. And he was in the perfect environment to feed, you know, a hungry mind like that, which as we know, there is almost no limits to what the mind can absorb. Mm. And his, um, his mother could read and write Greek and Latin. His his putative mother, his father was extremely well-educated, very powerful, very rich. And his grandfather was a legendary educator who had actually been the person responsible for educating King Edward, who I think only lived to be like 16 or something. But so who, education was all around. And yeah. apparently Elizabeth had another famous educator write a book on how to educate you know, children. So he was just fed books, and he had an astonishing memory. But a lot of this, you know, wasn't publicized. What I really think happened is that they knew they had this kind of like secret weapon. (sighs) Remember, everything was about espionage. Everybody had their own spy network. Everybody spied on each other. It was still very futile that way. And they were careful to reveal too much but there was an inner circle of course the Cecils you know the Tudors Essex Lester and I think they kind of I, what I think and I, I'm the only one I've ever heard this from is they just decided to keep it on the down low this incredible brilliance of this person but people knew and people did talk about it and you can find references to it that you know, he apparently read every book that was in print at the time. Yeah. I think he was a speed reader. I think he, he just had this incredible intellect. He dropped out of college at the age of 15. So they would go to college very young in those days, like 12, 13. But he dropped out at 15. He said, I'm bored. Uh, Plato and Plato and uh, Aristotle are boring, you know, they're not useful. They just quibble. And the philosophy of the time was uh, scholasticism, and they were trying to fit Aristotle into Christian philosophy. And I think Aquinas was the one that right, yeah. had done that best. So they were kind of making advances on Aquinas, and it was all this kind of nitpicking philosophy, which he sort of blamed on Plato and Aristotle. But anyway, at the age of 15, he already sort of had his life course because what he wanted was knowledge knowledge is power and he already saw that the type of philosophy of the greeks didn't give you knowledge about technology in the natural world which he then so i don't want to get ahead of myself so at 15 walsingham sent him to france which is where his career in espionage began Uh, and he went with uh a diplomat, Amius Paulette. Mm. And while there, yeah, his name will come up in your book. Yes, while there, does. he started making up uh, codes, cryptography. He started creating 
really advanced, really sophisticated secret codes that you could write letters in that would appear to be normal. But if you knew the code, you would be able to read the secret message, which he then disclosed that he had done this years later. And they're really fascinating uh, codes that he invented at the age of 15. And the rumors are that he fell in with a group of French intellectuals who were uh, revising the French language and trying to make advances on the French language. And at the time, English was, was only half formed. And the, and the English elite still spoke, Fran still spoke French, yeah. left over from the Norman occupation of England. And, and very few books were written in English. There was almost no classic books yet written in English. And they think that Bacon got the idea to do that with English at that time. And that he even started writing books at that time and translating books. So when you get into the real Bacon nuts, they think he was already writing novels and doing translations and even writing works of philosophy at this age. 15 so, to 18. Are we saying that Francis Bacon invented English then? Well, Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shakespeare is given that credit, and mm. it is true that English changed radically right at this time. Right. Like, all these books started to appear, all these translations the, from Latin started The King James to Bible. Mm. Same time King period. James Bible, the strongly rumored that Francis Bacon uh, played a large role in that. Oops. He's not given official <laughs> credit. Wow. You're not given official credit, but uh, uh, they think he must have been involved. He was very close with King James, King James Bible, and they know. And there's all, there's no records. They know that uh, uh, something like four groups of eight men worked on the Bible, and they used a couple of translations already done. And then they handed it in to James, and it sat with James for a year and then came out. And they think that year that it was with James, uh, Bacon got his hand on it. And there are clues in the, um, on some of these emblems. Like you see this here, this is from the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. You see this top thing here? Yeah. Those are called emblems. And that same emblem appears in on the first folio in the Shakespeare plays. Oh. So are these clues that were left around, like uh, here's one here. Um, Just another quick these double A, these things. Another quick aside, uh, King James Freemason yeah. as well. Oh, right, okay. Obviously. <laughs> uh, they say James was a Freemason. There were a lot of Freemasonry in uh, Scotland. This is the yep. kind of stuff that was on the, the Bible and there's all kinds of symbolism in there that people, you know, tr equate with, uh, bacon. But then look at this. This is really incredible. So this is Psalm 46 mm -hmm. from the Psalms of the old Testament. Psalm 46. If you count 46 words from the first word, God, right. Count 46 in. You come to the word here. Can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You come to this word, shake. <laughs> if you count 46 words from this word, refuge, the last word, you don't count Selah because all the, all the Psalms end in Selah. Okay. I forget what that means. Something like let it be or so it is. Yeah, so it is. Yeah. Count 46 back from refuge. What word do you think you're going to see? Spear. Spear. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. That's Shake, a hell Shake of a coincidence. Um, what a coincidence. And those are the kind of number games that they delighted in, what's called <laughs> Gematria and yeah. Kabbalistic number games. And there you go. I mean, come on. And I, if you go back yeah. to the previous translation or other translations, that doesn't happen. Those words are there. Uh, but he apparently arranged it perfectly that 46 oh. <laughs> <laughs> and just wonder how many more you know if he was into all this kind of coding and ciphers and all the rest of it he was doing it from the age or you know had been successful from the age of 
15. Mm. Um, how much well, more he thing. managed to bury in it, basically. Well, that's what a lot of bacon nuts do, is that they get really involved with the coding. The are, are, you, are, you, are you cleaning yourself in that, Robin? Yeah, bacon. no, you I'm must be a bacon nut. I'm trying to stay out nut. of that. I'm trying to say I'm not a bacon nut. <laughs> it which sounds is crazy tasty. because I've got, you know, a hundred books here about it or something. I mean, I've become a nut. Yeah, it's like I'm one of those people that, I got bit, you know. I got bit by this bacon thing. I think we're going to people. Wait. People then get into the plays and they take these codes and they take these numerological, you know, decoding devices and they they pull all these secret messages out of the plays and the sonnets and then they say, oh, because everyone wants to know where the plays are. If there's not one single written manuscript, you know, where are they? Where are the original manuscripts? So there's this whole thing about trying to find the original manuscripts. Wow. So, wh- so where did the earliest are... ones come from then? The earliest one what? The earliest manus- uh, you know, copies of the plays. Well, nobody's seen a manuscript, but they were then printed out in things called quartos that the acting companies would have or that you could even buy, I think. Right. And... Uh, then the big one, of course, is the first folio, that giant book. It's one of the most expensive books in the world now. It had all 36 plays, but 18 of them had never been published. They were brand new, maybe never even performed. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, that's for the Shakespeare scholars, which is another enormous world of Shakespeare mm-hmm. scholarship. And they all think Willie wrote the plays, and they just analyze them. Uh, then the, investigating his life was an industry, you know, for 200 years. He's the most researched person ever, probably, or one of the most, for sure. And uh, the 18 plays had been performed in their work portos, but some of them had been radically changed. And nobody knows who changed them or when, but they're very different than the plays that were originally performed at the Globe Theatre. But there are no original manuscripts. They don't exist. So people want to know, well, they must be somewhere. And (laughs) they'll pull these secret messages out of the plays and go digging off somewhere. They go, oh, they're they're over here by the River Wye. And they'll they'll pay a lot of money or spend years of their lives digging a hole in the ground, you know, thinking they're going to find these manuscripts. There's a guy named Alan Green. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah who thinks they're at the church in Stratford. And he did this whole amazing decoding thing. And mm. Does he think they're, bu- they're buried under the altar? Yeah, that's what he thinks. Mm. And he's got all this intriguing circumstantial evidence mm. for that. But there's a documentary on YouTube called Cracking the Shakespeare Code for this Norwegian Freemason whose name I forgot. He's a really brilliant guy, really cool guy. Uh, does the same thing. And he traces these things to Oak Island. So there's this place in Canada called Oak Island off the coast of Nova Scotia. I think it's Canada, right? It's not Maine. Where they think the manuscripts are buried. And there's all this crazy evidence for that. But I highly recommend that movie for anyone interested in this, Cracking the Shakespeare Code, because they put the Norwegian together with a London-based young Shakespeare scholar, and they sort of butt heads. They they become very friendly, and they talk about it. And the Shakespeare scholar, by the end, he never says it, but he's like, hell yeah, you're onto something, man. Like, he, he takes him through all the evidence. But he's really into cracking the codes. I just, I don't have any talent for that. I'm not really interested in that. I I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary, but maybe one day they'll find something. But that's a whole other area of Baconiana is all these places they've searched for these manuscripts, and they do find stuff. They find like walls that have been repaired. Like it looks like something was in there, and now it's been repaired. Uh, they think it might be. Uh, they don't know. I mean, but yeah, the Alan Green has a compelling theory this um norwegian guy and cracking the shakespeare code on youtube it's a great great documentary movie he he finally gave up i got to give him credit because he's a he's a solid character he's there's almost nothing 
else with him on the internet, but when you do find it, he's like, yeah, I decided I better just stop <laughs> obsessing about Shakespeare <laughs> and get on with my life. But now there's all these, yeah, anyway, that's the whole thing, Oak Island. And yeah, it's fascinating, another huge area that came out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, here's some more pictures. Here's Cecil. Here's Lord Cecil Burley. Lord Burley. He's been uh, that's an interesting thing. So Lord, the title Lord. In the Bible, Lord means God. And in the King James Bible, they, Bacon, I think it was Bacon, translated the word master as Lord. Uh, my Lord said to get the clay pots and bring them in. But oh, other wow. translations have master. And I think with this Gnostic thing and that they do, and this aristocratic thing, they do think of themselves as gods. That was That goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, where the the ruler was a god. And even Rome, there was some of that. Like when you died, you became a god. And I think this calling someone Lord, which is very uh, foreign, of course, to Americans, but I think it's a way to use language to reinforce this idea that, you know, we're in charge. Even God, like Lord literally means God in the mm. Bible, which I find... Uh, I mean, part yeah. of the uh, another part of the sort of Gnostic theology is that you you through these certain spiritual practices you can escape the reincarnation wheel and then ascend beyond the seven spheres or whatever it is and essentially become a god. It ties in exactly. with that. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Sounds cool. Yeah, have a go. Yeah. No, <laughs> it, it's very uh, it's very enticing. It's mm. very intriguing. Yeah. It, it gets very popular. Especially if you don't have to follow any, you know, moral laws. You can yeah. do what you want. Do what thou wilt. Yeah, mm. yeah mm. do what thou wilt. Uh, yeah, it gets quite popular. Here's, uh, here's Elizabeth's famous rainbow portrait, which blew my eyes. Look at the one eye symbolism. And there's the Gnostic snake, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I'll show you a, a full screen picture of that. But yeah, that that red dress it's just got these eyeballs and ears yeah eyeballs and yep. ears all over it it's bizarre mm. and that snake mm. which is very like because the, the a lot of gnostic sects literally worship the snake from the garden of eden yeah they, they the describe the, the yeah. serpent as being the embodiment of wisdom and uh, yep. whereas God in the garden is saying, you know, do not eat of this tree or you will shall surely die. And then the, the, the snake or serpent enlightens Eve mm. and uh, sort of proves God wrong because the, the fruit and they don't die. Exactly. You know, yeah. it's, it's very uh, compelling mm -hmm. theology. Look at all there this. There you go. Yeah. I mean that. There you go. What's it's that? It's a nice system they had. And I think that's what they're trying to recreate with this great reset is this whole thing right here. What's going on there, Robert, with uh, the, the bowing people? I think can't tell. Is it the Lord walking past there? Yep. Servants? The Lord is walking past and the servants must bow. Mm. That's what I do when I come home, though, to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, that's uh, the only way mm. we survive. I mean, this yep. this ties into something you talk about is, um, God, we're, we've gone over an hour already. And we haven't talked about so much. No. I know. It's just so much. It's just a vast, yeah. vast amount of stuff. They all, all these topics take an hour. They're on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, one look at this. So oh, this oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, for people listening or watching the video on the various platforms, if you go to the your website the hidden life is best there's tons of links there and and uh, yeah. book recommendations and video links and and websites yeah go it's there great. and yeah listen to the podcast they're packed with information it's it's crazy it's just an well like amount. the fact that you reference it you know you, you put your references in there where you're getting the stuff from so people can you know we don't have to take your word for it we can double check you know and find out more yeah yeah kabbalah is another massive topic mm that figures very prominently in most occult systems. 
really fascinating. Uh, there's the Royal Society, and we've got the history of science. And, you know, mm -hmm. science is uh, behind a lot of this craziness uh, with the virus. You know, it's all kind of sciencey, right? And they've kind of made science, this is kind of what got me into this, is this idea that science is really the newest religion, which is why I feel confident in saying Bacon is probably the most influential person of all time, because science is now the fastest growing religion, if not mm -hmm. the biggest religion. I mean, everyone's putting a mask on because they believe in science. The mantra now is trust the science. No trust in God. You know, people don't even talk about God anymore. Mm. You can debate God and Christianity all you want, but God, God help you if you start debating the science. I mean, mm. there's, there's words we can't say right now or we'll get banned from YouTube. We can say anything we want about religion. So it's flipped. You know, it's, it's all right, yeah. Because at one point, you, yeah. know, you would have been a heretic for talking mm. about, yeah. you know, if, we, if you're in this yeah. late Tudor period and you were a papist, <laughs> then you were going to be persecuted. Uh, whereas yeah. well, you're right, that's flipped on its head. Now you can do is say anything you like about any religion, yeah. pretty much, yeah. with a, a notable exception here or there. But it's the it's sort of the scientific um, what would the word dogma that's taken over. Mm. Yeah, it's a religion. They literally call you a heretic. I've seen it happen with scientists, <laughs> mm. yeah. and they have their relics, you know, their Darwinian skulls and their. <laughs> They've got their saints, you know, St. Darwin and St. Einstein. It's, it's absolutely, totally a religion because that's how the human mind works. We make religions out of things. Mm -hmm. Just so go. a lot of this has to do with, yeah, the nature of human consciousness. Uh, so it's big, man. It's a big topic. <laughs> Just go back to that, um, that folio from the Royal Society because that's something, it's funny, you sent me that on the email recently and yeah. I actually had it on my computer already. <laughs> Oh. This image, but it's a it's a funny one. Yeah. yeah, where'd that go? Or I can pull it up here. I even have it here. <laughs> here we go. Where'd it go? That's weird. Is this it? There it is. So this guy here is not long after Bacon's death, and it is to commemorate the founding of the Royal Society, which is the beginning of modern science right there. And they recognize Francis Bacon as their spiritual inspiration, as their absolute inspiration. He, he literally said, we need to make things like Royal Societies. We need groups of scientists getting together and sharing data. So they recognize Bacon uh, this is James, I think. They Char uh, Charles II, that. Charles II. This is, uh, I forget who he is. He was the head of the Royal Society at the time. or Yeah, Von, von Breekland or something like that it was. But there's just tons of Masonic symbolism <laughs> everywhere, arches and everywhere. And he's pointing, if you see his finger, that is the Templar cross right there called the splayed cross the famous red cross you know which again rates back to england the rose cross the red cross the red cross on the white flag um the tudor rose i think it all kind of relates back to the tudors and to mm -hmm. england but that is the templar cross right there which apparently columbus sailed under Right, yeah. Around America. And we've got the checkerboard and, uh, floor, like you will find in a, a Masonic, floor, yeah. Masonic temple. And Check you've got like, these compasses and set squares all over behind them. Yeah. And the, you've got the three main figures. So you've got like Charles II as the, the grand master position in the middle, and then the two wardens yeah. either side being the, the current president and the sort of inspiration behind the forming of the society not sure about the angel and what is relevant re relevances in there with the old trumpet i don't know there's uh i don't know what's in this bag he's holding oh yeah Dr yeah who there knows is. it looks like a sewing kit or something i don't know <laughs> i mean it's just obviously Masonic. It's the know? ancient man bag. I was going to say the ancient handbag. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. the ancient handbag. Ancient man bag. It's the ancient man bag. Well, yeah. It's the secrets of, uh, what, 
should have Ryan Seven here, shouldn't we, to well, tell us what they're right. There was that. I can't remember the name of the guy, the, the book on uh, Gebekli Tepe. He thinks it's a sunrise, doesn't he? The ancient handbag. What's um, his name? What's the name of the book? Oh. Decoding History? History, yeah. History Decoded. Yeah. Yeah, I'm blanking on his name as well. He's uh, an, another English guy, yeah. Yeah. But that one's a modern re- mason. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we could go on for days. You guys, you guys want to wrap this up? Or? Yeah, we'll let you go. I mean, yeah. it's been great. I've uh, really enjoyed this. Mm. Oh, good. Um, good. I'm glad. Thanks a lot, guys. Anything you want to say before you, we go? Other uh, than going to the hidden life is best dot com and yeah, checking out the hidden links. Life is best. Uh, listen to the podcast. Mm. Uh, hopefully, I'll turn this into a book. Oh, mm. cool. Yeah. I think this is, yeah, you've really kind of um, piqued my interest tonight. This is something I didn't really um, know much about, and I think it's something I'm definitely going to look into and listen to your podcast about, definitely. It's really fascinating. Mm, Christopher yeah. Marlowe, Sir Walter Raleigh, Essex. I mean, these guys, you know, they played for keeps. Essex lost his head and Raleigh lost his head. They were <laughs> major players, especially Essex. Essex was royalty. Yeah. Well, who just moved against the queen? I'll leave you with this. Okay, so <laughs> I, I I spoke with this baconite. So Essex, a bacon uh, nut, who was please. A bacon <laughs> nut. I spoke with this bacon nut about why what happened with Essex. So it's this famous thing that happened where the Earl of Essex. It's called the Essex Rebellion, where he stormed into the palace and confronted Queen Elizabeth about something nobody knows. Oh. And a few months later, he led a rebellion where he, right there on that map, the, the, the map is amazing. Go to the August map and click around. But the Essex house was right by the palace. They all lived right there on the Strand or nearby. And the theaters were right there. Uh, he tried to raise a rebellion against the queen. And it failed. He thought the common people would go with him. And it failed. And nobody really knows why. <sighs> He did this, but he got his head chopped off, and a couple other people did too. So the bacon nut told me, and I said, I think he's right. He goes, because Essex was very close to bacon. And some people think they might have been brothers. I don't quite go that far. They think that Essex stormed in on the queen to try to convince her to make bacon the next king. Oh. The bacon was in line to be king by, you know, by the divine right, by the divine thing. So... That could be, but this, and, uh, Earl of Essex lost his head. And it was, wasn't it a last minute decision to, to nominate James the sixth? Apparently it, those were Elizabeth's dying words. Yeah, like could, make you, it you James. You couldn't talk about succession. It was forbidden because she knew that if somebody's supposed to be king, they were just going to kill her and still <laughs> have her killed. <laughs> so apparently yeah, her dying words were like, let it be James. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then wild. James is a whole other thing. Yeah. Listen, guys, thanks a lot. Yeah. You're a lot of fun. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. And it's been I'll keep a, track of you online. It's been a pleasure, Robert. Um, just stay on the line for us for a few seconds while we play ourselves out sure. and stop the stream. All and right. uh, check out the links in the show notes, man. Yeah. It's great stuff. It is. Yeah. Right. Catch you on the flip side. See you in a bit. Catch you on the flip side, guys. Cheers. <laughs>